Hello and welcome. I'm Zena Martin, Education Consultant and Director of Inclusive Learning North. And we support primary settings and inclusive practice. If you haven't come across us before, please explore our website to find out more about our inclusion forums that we run in venues across the north of England uh, and online now. Uh, we also provide a service called ILOC that supports teachers and leaders in providing high quality, inclusive teaching and learning strategies informed by specialist approaches, along with intervention strategies, SENCO support and training. We provide a year long professional development package for SENCO's new to post, as well as continued training and consultancy for schools, uh, both face to face and of course online now. Uh, our website is also a very good place to find signposting to some of our other recommended specialists and consultant colleagues uh, who can support the needs of your school. So this presentation is all about putting the code of practice into practice. It is 292 pages in all. Um, that's a lot of reading uh, and a lot of writing. Um, and we can be forgiven for thinking that it's not really about very much on a practical context, but actually it is. And I'm gonna show you what that code looks like in that practical context. If you put all 292 pages of the code of practice into a word shower, you get this. And I know it's slightly gimmicky, but I'm really thrilled with that because what I and Inclusive Learning North really represent is not the children who can't do. Uh, we represent teaching and learning for children who can do. SEND for me is all about finding out what children can do. And often the reason that some children are struggling to learn, the barriers that exist for them are simply because the educators around them have not yet discovered what it takes to enable their learning. So the can do becomes absolutely paramount. I'm looking for assessment that gives me information about their learning profile that says things like, this child can learn really well when information is prevent presented in a highly visual manner or when it's highly multisensory, or when there is high levels of repetition, and then they can learn. That's what I'm looking for. That's what, for me, SEN is all about. So here is the code of practice in a nutshell. These are the underlying principles. You'll find all of these in chapter one. This is what the code is all about. And at the bottom there, very prominent, is that the big sea change in 2014 was that there was increased choice and control for children themselves and their parents. But that requirement has not been consistently um, met right across the country or indeed across settings. And I think many have found it very difficult to know how to increase uh, that control for parents. Um, in a meaningful way and without feeling that we are losing control as professionals. And I always say, you know, one of the big questions for me is if we're really serious about giving choice and control to children and parents, OK, that's great. But how do you engage a six year old child with speech, language and communication needs in a meaningful uh, dialogue or communication about what is best for their provision or how they view the provision they've had or the progress they've made. But our code of practice does clearly state that following the Children and Families Act, uh, the views, wishes and feelings of the child or young person and their parents must be given full regard. And it emphasises the importance of children and parents participating as fully as possible in decisions and being provided with information and support necessary to enable participation in those decisions. And I'm really pleased to say that we've got organisations such as the Communication Trust who have devised really 
um, good, strong, practical and visual activities that can engage children uh, who have speech and language difficulties in, uh, in being able to take part in these conversations. Um, and it emphasises the need to support children and parents in order to facilitate their development and to help them achieve the best possible educational and other outcomes and prepare them effectively for adulthood. So that's clearly the prominent principle of the whole code of practice, choice and control. And we might think that we've achieved that, but successive inquiries and reports are telling us that actually across the board, we're not really. So let me introduce you to Jennifer. Jennifer has just moved into Key Stage 2. Uh, she's in a mixed year 3-4 class. Uh, the school is quite small. Uh, her, she has two class teachers uh, who are in a job share together. Um, there are two teaching assistants who do various intervention programmes throughout the week. Um, and Jennifer also has a report that her mother commissioned, um, which states that she has dyslexia. At the moment, her mum is very dissatisfied at how Jennifer is being supported. Uh, she says that Jennifer is coming home crying every night. Um, she's not happy being in the class. Uh, and there are some mixed views from staff as to why this is. Um, there's a, some, some that think that it's because mum wants one-to-one -one support for Jennifer and can't have it. And some people think it's to do with Jennifer's homework that's causing all the distress. So we've got some mixed messages going on there. So I think this calls for a solution focused approach. And one of the first questions that I want to ask of Jennifer's mum is, what do you want for Jennifer when she's 15 years old? Now, this idea of finding out the aspirations is incredibly powerful. It's certainly not the what's the problem approach. We're not interested in the problem at the moment. We're interested in the big picture. Where are we aiming for here? And then what is the most significant difficulty for Jennifer? And this is where mum says it's about the support and when it comes. So she doesn't have an issue with the support itself or with her having support. She's not even actually requesting one to one support. She's just saying it's when it happens that the, the problem arises. So we start off with now a person centred approach to things and I arrange a, a gathering where it consists of uh, Jennifer's mum and her teachers, and teaching assistants and also Jennifer's sister. Uh, her sister is older than her but in the same class, remember it's a year three, four class and Jennifer often relies on her sister a bit and uh, finds, you know, she gives her a lot of confidence. We find out what everybody likes and admires about Jennifer. Very important for Jennifer to hear. We find out what's important to Jennifer right now. Um, and speaking French is very important because she's just started to learn it and everyone's learning it. Same you know, level playing field and all of that. And she's she's good at it. And the teacher thinks that sorting out the timetable would help. She thinks that's causing Jennifer a lot of anxiety because she is moving now between different classrooms for different interventions, between different teachers and assistants, and it's causing a lot of confusion for her. Important in the future, she wants to be an artist. She wants to have a good job. And apparently she's very good at art. Uh, we see some of her pictures and they're fantastic. And um, that's what she wants to do. Working and not working. Um, well, mum talks about the some of the interventions, particularly those happening before school, they're pretty good, um, but some of them are not. And she doesn't feel they're working. And the biggest problem is that they're happening during the school day when the, the, the mainstream curriculum's going on. And this is very distressing for Jennifer. She's particularly concerned because some of the interventions she's being taken out of French and art. And we know what she thinks about French and art. 
Um, what do we need to know or do? We start to talk about things that could enable Jennifer to access the mainstream curriculum rather than focusing on intervention. What adjustments can we make so that Jennifer can take part in writing in the classroom? We talk about clicker, we talk about mind maps and so on. And we talk about the struggle being the when the help comes. You know, yes, we want help for her, but when is it going to come? And so we start to build up a, a plan of thinking about maintaining the morning interventions that are working. Uh, where intervention happens, it must be to enable Jennifer's increased participation in the classroom. Um, we think about visual timetables for her and she becomes the monitor of the class visual timetable so that suddenly rather than being on the back foot never quite knowing where she should be or what's happening she's on the front foot and children are going up to her to ask her what's going to be happening today we can take exactly the same principles giving choice and control to children but in a much more complex way um, this is a record of an annual review done in graphics, where children can become so engaged in their own planning, their own reviewing, uh, identifying for themselves what's working, what's not working, what they enjoy doing, and why not? Why shouldn't we be doing it that way? And yet, this is still not common everyday practice. It is sporadic. And so that preparation for adulthood, well, we touched a little on that with Jennifer's um, example there, didn't we? Um, so let's have a look at what preparation for adulthood might look in a primary context. OK. So I'm going to give you um, a, a little story of a, a boy who was in year six. Um, I was lucky to be present at this review, uh, although I did. I take no credit for it. I did not organise it. Um, it was the Senko who decided that she wanted more, greater engagement for the child in his review process. He's moving into year seven. Uh, why shouldn't he have? And so what we did was look at him planning his own annual review. And it was explained to him, I believe, as a kind of gathering, a bit like a party um, where we all get together and uh, talk about what, what's worked well and what, you know, what hasn't worked well and what things we want to talk about for the future when you go to high school. And so he planned the whole thing. He decided where it was going to happen. It was going to happen in the hall. Uh, he decided on the refreshments. Um, he even baked buns with his mum to bring along to this annual review. Um, and that was the start of it. Um, he he decided he also wanted everyone to play his favourite game, which was Guess Who? And this was a stroke of genius. Uh, now, some schools might have said, oh, well, we don't really do things like that at these kinds of meetings. Um, they went with it. They went with it and they gathered together as many boxes of Guess Who as they could find in wet play boxes. And he had a couple of sets at home. And what it meant was that he put us together in teams and he had been strategically placed in a team with the high school Senko and the high school Senko who hats off to her she just went with all of this she said well I'm not really sure about the rules of this game could you explain them to me and so this boy who is very wary of people he doesn't know uh, and really struggles to have eye contact with people he sat alongside her and he explained the rules so we're starting to see connection building and then at the end of the game we'd all thoroughly enjoyed it we'd had the refreshments and he presented uh, his profile about about him he talked about what he was looking forward to for high school and things that concerned him and whereas the things that concerned us and his mum were about how he would find his way around the building this was what concerned him. He wanted to get the bus every day with the other kids. He'd seen the other kids getting the bus to school and he wanted to do that by himself without a grown up having to go with him. The rest of the meeting was devoted to working out a strong plan for how that would happen. And in September it happened. 
inclusion and removing barriers. There are very few schools that would would say we are not inclusive. We don't want to be inclusive. I come across schools that all want to be inclusive and often will describe themselves as so. Uh, and and perhaps that's your setting. But in some ways, we have to be a little bit more self-reflective and think inclusion is a very elusive thing. And we are constantly moving in and out of inclusion and what constitutes inclusion. And how do we know when, when we're as inclusive as we can be? Is there a measure? Well, let's have a think. I, I tend to work from some of the principles that came out of the research of uh, Lani Florian, um, who worked with schools in Scotland, primary schools in Scotland, um, and built this whole idea that the curriculum and teaching and learning should not be about who is going to learn what. Blue group are going to do this, red group will do that, and green group will do that. Instantly, we put ceilings on what children will achieve. She worked on a, a, a teaching and learning methodology that was based on every child will be learning this. And the challenge for the teacher is how they're all going to learn it rather than who is going to learn it. And with that kind of attitude and approach, along with taking away the barriers to learning that do exist, we're then moving towards inclusion. Now, the what is going to be taught and how we're going to learn it, you might think that's um, simply done. You know, it's, it's simple to write in a little circle there, but it's a lot harder to envisage what that looks like in practice if you've got a group of children in year five, but you've got two children who are assessed as working at a year one level or a year two level. That's a much bigger challenge now, isn't it? Well, one of the things that I like to do is look at the resource implications. So rather than thinking about the curriculum as this sort of linear approach to things, a lot of children with SEN don't really think and learn like that. Often they are quite big picture thinkers. Uh, they're not the little inchworm, uh, uh, you know, process people. And so we have to kind of look through their eyes and think, how would they learn and access this. And so I tend to use a lot of this kind of material. These are Cuisinaire rods, um, if you haven't come across them before. Um, an amazing piece of kit and they enable children to really visualise uh, the number system. Um, in this case, it's about visualising the, the concept of adding one to a number. And you can see very clearly as you add a white rod onto the next one and the next one and the next one, you end up with um, uh, the next rod up. And then as we continue, we can flip it round as well, can't we? We can say, well, what would it look like if, um, if we put a light green rod uh, next to a brown and red? And suddenly we're kind of reversing what we've just learned. So yes, we knew that two and one made three and three and one made four. Uh, but what if we flip that on its head and turn them round? And what we've got effectively is number bonds to 10. But we've got it in a very, very visual way, a highly visual representation of what number bonds to 10 might look like. And following that work that Lani Florian started up, it got me to thinking, is there really a, an inclusive lesson structure? Is there a way that lessons could be mapped out in an inclusive fashion? Um, and I came up with this, and this is a work in pro, this will always be a work in progress because research con continually moves on. And I think some of these things in these boxes, primary teachers are pretty familiar with. Um, but when I've worked with primary teachers 
to find out which of these components they're more confident with and which they are least confident with. The ones that come at the bottom of the list that they are repeatedly, quite consistently least confident with are the ones in the middle, in the blue band, the structured discovery learning, the instructional multisensory strategies, the reasonable adjustments and technological resource aids, metacognition, and yet these are the things that we know make the huge difference for children with SEND, many children with SEND. There are many, many commonalities, um, but these are the things that we're least confident with. Um, what I didn't know at the time was that uh, a, a universal design for learning, interestingly, has sort of built um, at a similar time to this over in the United States. And I'm currently um, kind of looking at where the crossovers are, because there clearly are many between that and what this is. Um, but then moving on from that, it leads us nicely into the whole concept of high quality provision. What does high quality provision look like? Um, and I started to, uh, to do a lot of training um, on my components of an inclusive lesson. And I did model lessons and demonstrations and what does structured discovery learning actually look like? What does a multi-sensory strategy look like? And this was not about intervention. This was not about just children with SEND. This was about saying to teachers, start from the needs of the children with SEND in your mainstream lessons and build from there, because you will find if you can teach this concept of ratio to your children with SEND in the ways they learn it, oh boy, you will find that all your other children will learn it probably quicker than they would have done with more traditional methods okay so that was kind of where i came came in at this from so this is where ilop comes into play um ilop the the drivers behind it really were around the fact that i felt that schools in my view were moving very quickly down the graduated response to uh seeking individual assessment for individual children when as I saw it a lot of provision hadn't really been got right in the classroom yet uh, there was still a lot to address but how to achieve that kind of development with such a short window as a visiting specialist gets is very difficult and so ILOP seemed the perfect platform for that um, I encountered teachers who often felt quite disempowered, you know, lacking confidence or expertise uh, in teaching children with SEND. Uh, and I think sometimes the presence of the specialist can kind of create that or exacerbate that. And what ILOP tries to do is say, you're the class teacher, you're the expert of your children. All you need is just uh, uh, some pointers, strategies, guidance. You can do this. Um, it also responded really to a lot of the low budgets that schools were experiencing and the very high costs associated with a lot of purchased resources um, that were often beyond them. And what I find is that, you know, teachers, you know, they were responding really positively to a lot of the training I was running on quality first teaching uh, and the 12 components. Um, and they would go away and come back and say, you know, oh, I loved the counting in twos. All of my year one children can count in twos now. That's brilliant. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, a year six teacher saying, you know, they absolutely loved the handwriting and they can all do it. They can all join in this beautiful handwriting now. Can't believe it happened so quickly. Fantastic. But what they did find was that thinking up all the ideas and the ways of doing things is very difficult when you have so many things to do as a class teacher um, and that's what ILOP seeks to do we're building gradually to having a strategy for most of the English and maths objectives in the key stage one and two curriculum um, most of them contain resources and powerpoints so that teachers can use them as teaching aids all homemade, of course, um, as primary practitioners, we are brilliant at 
creating our own resources and I make no apologies for the fact that ILOP is exactly that you know it's it's authentic um, but it's very heavily informed by specialist approaches uh, for those children with SEND and indeed all of the rest of your children in the class um, it has instructions video tutorials intervention strategies for what teachers identify their own children are struggling with um, and Senko support as well, that Senko submit questions for us. Uh, and online training and consultancy has now started on Zoom um, this last couple of terms. So it's a very exciting project um, for us and for the schools that have joined us with that. Um, so in terms of high quality provision, a few tips for the do's and the don'ts. Do, start provision from what the child needs. Involve children and parents and carers uh, in decisions about provision. Give them choice and control. Consider that preparation for adulthood, access, independence. Expect teachers to lead the collaboration with appropriate training and SENCO support wherever required. And respond to external advice that comes in perhaps through specialist or EP reports. Don't. Use intervention as a substitute for high quality, inclusive classroom practice. Seek to develop that constantly. Try and find out what you don't know. <laughs> that's, uh, that's always a challenge, isn't it? But there's always something more that could be done. Don't use teaching assistants to perform roles for pupils that actually could be done with other strategies, other resources, technology, things that aid independence. Um, Increasingly, as technology is becoming more and more advanced and sophisticated, I less and less see the need for the teaching assistant to perform the role of the adult scribe. Children need to be taught how to use speech to text effectively and how to use spell checking systems effectively so that they independently can record their thoughts. Don't put school efficiency before children's needs when timetabling intervention. I think that's a little bit um, like what happened with Jennifer, really. And don't remove the responsibility and accountability for SEND from class teachers. Uh, ILOP seeks to build that. It seeks to um, encourage independence, um, encourage responsibility and encourage accountability. And we come to collaboration, almost at the top of the pyramid now. This is Salma, and I'm interested in the people Salma is connected to. Um, anyone who's read is someone who loves Salma. People who are blue are people who like Salma, but they are paid to be connected to her. So let's see who we've got. Uh, first of all, we've got Salma's mum and dad. Now, I've deliberately placed Salma's mum and dad very close to Salma because they are very close to her. They're closely connected to her. So they're stood right next to her. And we also have this person here who is Salma's uncle, Uncle Ahmed. He's very close to her as well. So he's standing right next to her. And she's got some brothers. She's got Abdul, Noor and Nabil. And they're not as closely next to her as mum and dad and uncle, but not far away. And then we've got Auntie Zainab. OK, and uh, again, quite close to her, not as close as mum and dad, but she does rather love her Auntie Zainab. Auntie Zainab's quite funny and makes her laugh and uh, so we've got a good close relationship with Auntie Zainab. And we've got Janice. Now Janice is the respite carer. So Janice is quite close to the family. Um, you know, she steps in and does a lot of work with Salma. Salma likes her very much. Um, and obviously Janice has a lot of responsibility for Salma. Uh, she also has her sister. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? That um, in terms of how close the connection is, she's more closely connected to Janice than she is to her sister Shabnam. Shabnam's quite a bit older than her. 
and in her teens and she's kind of got her own life now and um and then we've got mrs crab the class teacher she's a blue person obviously um she's connected to Selma, but in a paid capacity um we've got uh, the school caretaker, the teaching assistant, the Senko. School caretaker uh, is uh, very friendly with Salma, uh, always has a laugh and a joke with her. So she's got quite a nice connection there. And then we've got some other blue people over here. Uh, these are um, the GP, Dr. Mackay, uh, the speech and language therapist, the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist. And yes, there's kind of a little bit more distant. You know, she doesn't see them a lot. She sees them every once in a while. Um, they get on with her well, but she's, you know, not there every week. Um, and then we've got this person here. This is Ms. Wozaluski. She is the educational psychologist. Very rarely sees her. And the local authority EHCP coordinator who is clearly connected to Selma, has something to do with Selma, but rarely sees her, possibly at an annual review. So by and large, as a rule of thumb, the red people are much closer to Selma than the blue people um, because they love her. They're part of her close connection network. Uh, Janice is a bit closer than one of the red people, just because of the role she has and the relationship that her and Salma have. But let's just see who gets invited to Salma's annual review. And let's see what the, the colour pattern looks like now. Suddenly, Salma is not surrounded by red people. Suddenly, she's surrounded by just two red people and a lot of blue people. Suddenly, all those blue people have got an awful lot of decision making power about Selma. And actually, if I'm really honest, Selma is often not there herself. And if she is, it's for 10 minutes. She's certainly not like that boy I told you about in year six, who really had a strong control over everything that was happening just because of the way the Senko set up that annual review to make sure that we talked about things that were important to him, to make sure that he had ownership over this plan that we were devising to help him get the bus. But a lot of annual reviews, Salma is completely missing. And many secondary schools find this bizarre because they, um, <laughs> they're, they're quite accustomed to students being part of that process all the time. And you may have come across that phrase, nothing about me without me. Maybe we need to look more seriously at how we can enable that within our primary contexts with our younger children. And I was really pleased that Jennifer's sister came along because Jennifer was a, Jennifer's sister was a red person. So this is how we need to, to, to be thinking about things. Who are the people who love the child? You know, the people who are really going to make things work and they're going to make it work because they love her. And then beyond that, who are the people who can open doors for them? Yes, there is a place for the blue people to be there, definitely, because they're the people who can open doors. They're the people who have knowledge, who can inform us. But it's just slightly refining our perspective on that. And I must acknowledge that that concept, start with the people who love the child and move then to the professionals who can open doors for them. Uh, I take that from my colleague, Colin Newton, from uh, Inclusive Solutions. I wish that were my gem, but it isn't. Um, and finally, early identification. What does that look like? Well, I think the strongest schools are the ones that really have nailed assessment. And I don't mean just assessment for SEND. I think if schools are desperately looking for some kind of assessment for SEND because, you know, I don't really know how much progress the children with SEND are making, it will only be as successful as the general assessment systems of the school. Uh, and something that I have been advocating is, um, you know, looking at wave one, two, three, um, not just in terms of intervention, 
but in terms of assessment, where we are triangulating a range of assessment. We're triangulating qualitative judgments. You know, oh, Finlay was never bringing his reading book home, but now, now that the books are all about tractors, he's always got it with him. He doesn't hide it at the back of his tray anymore. That is assessment. It's qualitative. I can't put a number on it, but it shows progress. Some kind of standardised assessment. You know, many good interventions will come with some form of standardised assessment or some kind of measure of exit data and uh, sorry, entry data and exit data. And the curriculum objectives, where are they in terms of, um, you know, the teacher assessment? But I think we need to pull that triangulation of assessment together in, ter in per terms of looking at the progress of children in the four areas of need, communication and interaction, cognition and learning, uh, SAMH and physical and sensory needs. Um, in terms of what that might look like, well, in communication and interaction, uh, it may be that at wave one, schools might be following the communicating the curriculum document that the communication trust produce which which does a far better job of a speaking and listening curriculum than actually the national curriculum does if you haven't come across it it's free to download communication trust communicating the curriculum um it it might be that the school is using something like um speech or language link um, to screen children speaking and listening. Uh, many schools do use that, um, uh, and, or they might, might use Talk Boost or something like that to do a full screening of, um, to give them a standardised score of uh, speech and language for each child. Uh, not something that they would do every year, but something that they would do every few years to just make sure that they're not missing children. And of course, we've got the qualitative information, the support, the reporting to parents, children's, a record of children's developing vocabulary. And that's long before we've got into wave two, the, the kinds of assessment we might do for SEN support, which might include more person centred type reviewing, which might include um, something like pivots or a, a, a Birmingham SEN toolkit or some additional type of assessment. Um, if we think of it in terms of cognition and learning, uh, I think we're at gym. most schools are pretty well set up with this. We've certainly got uh, plenty of teacher assessment of English and maths. Um, we've, you know, we've got plenty of um, standardised scores very often for children at English and maths, uh, although that varies from school to school. Um, but we can start to think about, you know, what that might look like in terms of picking up on those children you know, who are struggling with literacy, struggling with maths. Uh, but again, if the wave one systems of assessment are not strong, it's going to be more difficult to compensate at wave two because wave one is about screening. Wave one is about identifying those children before they're on the SEN register, as it were, identifying them early. Um, social, emotional and mental health, there's been a lot of talk about screening for this and many schools do, many schools use things like Thrive Approach or Boxall Profiles to screen their pupils and if you're doing that for all your children, your whole class, you're able to identify children's needs early. You know, you're picking up on things bef you know, before they escalate into something else. And so we can see a kind of assessment pyramid. Yes, as children, as children do uh, require SEN support, perhaps the type of assessments they need need to be more thorough, a bit more detailed, perhaps a bit more standardised, maybe, um, perhaps a bit more person centred as well. Um, but we are looking at a wave one, two, three type of assessment. Um, and similarly with physical and sensory. Um, some schools use things like uh, the BEAM assessment in foundation stage to, to just get a clear picture of what all children's gross motor development is like. Um, it, you know, in some, uh, thankfully, I, I've noticed in, in some schools, um, there's uh, now hearing checks for all children again, which I thought had become a thing of the past, but some um, 
uh, health provision is now um, making, you know, kind of providing that now for schools in their area. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Um, so again, we're thinking about what it would look like at wave one, how we would triangulate that assessment for all children, and then how we would triangulate assessment for children at wave two who were hitting SEN support or EHCP needs. And then, of course, yes, you have got in your graduated approach some wave three external assessment. But my goodness, haven't you got an awful lot before you need to get there? You've got a lot of information before there's a, a necessity for that. Little task for you before I finish. Um, the Senko role. Um, this is a word shower uh, based on um, the roles of the Senko from uh, the um, standards, the Senko standards uh, from the Senko award. And all I want you to do is pick out the most prominent words, scribble them down, half a dozen, what are the half a dozen words that stand out the most to you? You've probably got something that looks a bit like this. And so I think if we're thinking about if that's the role of the Senko and that's the, the, the kind of thing that we, we are valuing most in our SEN provision, then that's not too challenging to hang on to, is it? Because at the end of the day, we will know the success of our SEN provision by the progress children are making, the outcomes that they're having, the impact of the provision we're making. It is all about getting the provision right, getting the resources right, and having the kinds of reviews that are meaningful, that are recorded conversations, that are conversations that every stakeholder is involved in, in a way that they can access, and not just about filling in Word documents uh, and boxes. I will leave you with um, some information about ILOP, should you be interested. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us here at Getting It Right For Me Live. Let me ask you a really quick question. Are you here because you are hoping to develop your skills and your knowledge and all your learning and understanding around supporting and caring for children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities? I assume that's what you've come here for. We hope that you're enjoying um, your time here with us. There's some amazing people and we're so grateful for them. I'm coming and being part of this. And we're so grateful for you to be joining us as well. There's a couple of things I just really quickly wanted to introduce you to. First of all, don't forget that you can upgrade your ticket at any time to one of the 
pay tickets, which we try to keep the price as low as we possibly can just to cover what we need to help out the speakers a little bit um, and make sure this event is as good as it can be. What that means is you can access the live Q&A sessions that we're running throughout the event and you can access all the sessions for up to a year afterwards if you buy one of those paid tickets. Check out the whole school ones. How that works is if you book the whole school ticket and you can pay online or you can drop us a line and we'll issue an invoice and we'll sort it all out, that's absolutely fine. But we'll then make it possible for all your staff to be able to access all the sessions here at Getting It Right For Me Live this year. So do hope that's helpful. The other thing I want to mention is, and there are lots of members joining us this week, so thank you so much to those of you who are members, but we have put together, if you're looking to go deeper and access ongoing support and help and training, either as an individual, as a parent, as a professional supporting someone with additional needs, in, in a school or educational setting, or from a professional point of view, we have put together here at Scudia TV with Lynn McCann and her team at Reach Out ASC, a fantastic membership that starts at just £10 a month and includes a wide range of courses to help you support those in your care. There's a load of resources and tools, printable um, things that you can use to work with those children and support them. And there's more content being added all the time. One of my favorite parts of the membership is there is a, a, a peer group community that's built into that. So you can ask questions of Lynn and her team and your peers built right into that membership as well. As I say, it starts at just £10 a month whole school memberships are there we're offering trust wide memberships and local authorities have started to get in touch and offer this to their to um, their staff across a range of schools as well we would love for you to join our community if you've got any questions on that drop us a line i um, but very much hope to see you there and thank you so much enjoy the rest of the event <music>